For now, uh, I'm a Taoist, or at least I practice Taoist uh, systems. So specifically, I'm going to come here and talk to you about Nadan, um, internal alchemy, which is a, a bit of a, a strange practice, because I, my opinion is that Buddhism is fairly well preserved, especially because of places like Bhutan and Thailand and things like this, the different forms of Buddhism. But Taoism, in my opinion, is a little bit of a mess. Uh, it hasn't been preserved very well. I think the Cultural Revolution in China did a bit of a well, wonderful job, really, of doing what it was trying to do, which was demolish all of the traditions that were there. So consequently, when I wanted to find something about alchemy, it was very, very difficult. Because in, I still maintain that you cannot find, very easily anyway, Nadam practices in the West. And I, I want to explain a little bit as to why that's the case. So in order to learn, I had to, well, I had to travel a lot and go to China and learn the language and learn about the culture and meet people and dead ends and lots of dead ends, many, many dead ends. And then eventually get through some of the hurdles of being a white person trying to learn and they couldn't really understand why and things like that. But then eventually started to find people that would teach me this practice of Nadan. Okay, so Nadan is divided into several parts. And I think, I don't want to be the next Wim Hof, especially after following that previous lecture. I don't want to make that mistake. But I do think there are some direct parallels between the alchemical process and some of the six yogas of Naropa, especially at the beginning with regards to Tumo. Because they are both based on the same thing, not on staying uh, hot in the Himalayas or anything like that, but essentially on trying to initially develop a kind of Hmm, movement of energy through the body that does somatically feel like heat, that burns away blockages within the channels and eventually releases uh, something called the alchemical pill uh, from inside the head, essentially. That's the basis of what they're trying to do with alchemy. And this is what I was uh, trying to study. It took me a long time to try and find someone who could teach me this. So, I thought about this talk and I thought, right, if I ch start trying to find similarities between Nadan and Tumo, I'm going to fall flat on my face because I'm aware that in this room I'm probably the guy with the least knowledge on Tumo. I'm assuming that within your tradition you know a lot more than me. So what I thought I'd do is instead, after learning a little bit about it, was pick up on some of what I think are the clear differences between alchemy and Tumo. And then maybe some of the similarities you'll be able to see for yourselves, uh, I think. So the first one... Um, that I think is quite major is that within alchemy, especially within um, traditional lines of it, you're not allowed to visualize. That's the first rule. There's no visualization and no imagination allowed. It's, it's kind of almost, if you start doing that, they hit you with a stick. It's very, very strict. And this was something that was unusual to me when I first encountered uh, the tradition in Asia because the version I'd been taught in the West had lots of imagination. Picture this, trigrams, fire, heat symbols, and things like this. And then when I get to Asia, it's like, no, have to stop. Like, none of that. That all has to end. And I'll explain why, what their logic is to that in a little while. And the second one is that it's quite divorced from religion, essentially. It's quite separated from it. But funnily enough, the deep you go into Taoism, it's almost like the religion aspect to it gets added later. It's like something you encounter further down the line rather than right at the beginning. Uh, how do I change the slide? Is that done for me? Ah, okay. So, uh, these charts here that you see on the, on the, the slides, these basically uh, show a lot of the principles, if you can understand, it's kind of hidden there in sort of twilight language, of how alchemical processes work, specifically the, the firing process. It's a, it's a funny one because when I first got there, before, I'm, I'm used to just, you know, you want to learn something, you turn up on a workshop, pay your price, someone teaches you, uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case when I first got to Asia. So when I finally encountered people within the Dragon Gate sect who were prepared to show me how to practice alchemy, the first thing I had to do was a lengthy uh, sort of character, I would say character assassination process, actually. It wasn't really character analysis. They basically tore me to bits and pointed out all of the sort of stupidities within me and things like this. So there was a huge sort of exploration of who I was. But then the next part after this was that they actually had to take your body apart, not literally, not with sores and things, but they have to tear apart all of your alignments and put your body back together so that it's more efficient for the alchemical process. This was kind of the, the basis of what they do with you at first. 
So you go through, yeah, we'll stay on this slide for a little while, actually. We go through a, a lengthy process at the beginning of opening the body up. That's the first thing. Everything must be pulled apart. And when they say open the body, uh, what they're essentially talking about is very literal. They want more space between all of your bones. Have you ever seen the Haynes Motor Manuals? If you know what those are in the West, where they explode out the diagram of the, the car. That's what they're trying to do to your body. They want everything open, everything, lots and lots and lots of space. So it's a, it's a highly painful process. Uh, but they're doing this to get the body ready for the kinds of fire that you're going to move through your system. Next one. Okay. So on the right, I love these little charts. Uh, it, it's kind of, it reminds me of someone trying to draw something 3D whilst carving it into rock hundreds of years ago. It's obviously a very tricky thing for them to do. But over on the side, what we have is the ding and the loo, or the cauldron and the furnace. And on the left, you have the Neijing 2, the inner diagram uh, chart, that shows the basis of this process. So, for a long time, what they're trying to do at the beginning with the alchemical process is they want to build the fuel that you require for the training. Because their view is within Taoism that human beings don't have the fuel in place. It's not there. So if you're going to develop, okay, Taoist opinion, as my disclaimer, but if you're going to then try to generate these fires, it's going to be almost impossible if the substance isn't there, if you haven't fueled the body up. Maybe if you started at age four or five, maybe you'd have that fuel there. But if you've lived a life and done stuff and been tired and had fun and all the things that burn up your energy, then you need to put that substance back into the body. So if I had more time, I'd explain the meaning of the chart, but just pictures for you to enjoy. The actual basis of it is that they have two forms of energy, yin and yang, uh, that they're trying to consolidate into the abdominal space. This is the basis of what they're trying to do. So for a long time, Yin and yang were really hard for me to understand because, of course, when you're taught it, you're taught that it's uh, just a concept, dark and night, up and down, left and right, day and night, blah, blah. But actually, within the practice of Neidan, they're quite literal. Uh, so, yin chi, the first thing we require, is gathered through the silencing or the stilling of the, the mind. There's a whole process behind it. So it starts with a very meditative process where we basically have to learn to absorb into the things that are more permanent with the mind and then step away from the things that are transient, uh, the basis of it. Gradually, as this happens, there's a consolidation of a form of energy within the abdomen, which feels like a magnet. That's the basis of it. It's like a giant magnet that gets stronger and stronger and stronger within the abdominal space. This magnet becomes a container, sort of brief version of the process, and then they start to direct what they call yang chi down into that area, which is a form of electricity. It's an electrical current. The stronger and stronger it gets, the more electrical it comes within the body. So there, their symbology starts to change from a sphere in the abdomen, the dantian, through to they start talking about lightning and electricity and shocks and things like this. And they're all very sort of literal of the experience of the yang chi building. Okay? These two, when they come together, become the fuel for our process, for the alchemical process. Next slide. So, from here, what they start to do is they start to then use that fuel to compress it within the abdomen. And this is done with uh, very specific breathing processes, um, which aren't very gentle. Uh, they can be quite uncomfortable, they can feel a bit like they're crushing your guts. Normally, the first time you do it, you don't go to the toilet for about a week afterwards because it's a little bit excessive. Some of the actions, everything gets a bit packed in there. But it starts to drive all of that energy into a very, very small space, a small sphere. Now, in understanding the basis of what they're doing and why they link it to, um, why they link it to heat, is I think the body very much like an electrical circuit at the beginning, which I know is a very unspiritual way of thinking about it. But at the beginning, that yang chi, the primary place it's going to move is through your nervous system. That's where it's going to move. If you feel it, it's in your nerves. That's kind of the rule. So even though there's something more subtle in the background, the subtle channels, the central channel, the channels on the sides, the level that you're experiencing or feeling at the beginning of something like the firing process is in the nerves. It's, it's in the body. You're feeling the kind of the shadow of the subtle work, if you want, or another layer of reflection of that subtle work. So if you think about an electrical circuit, if too much power goes through that area and it hits resistance, then it heats up. That's what's going to happen. Like if you have a cheap electrical device, plug it into the wall, it gets very, very hot. 
The same starts to happen in your abdominal space when I draw all of that energy in together, when that yang chi is compressed into that space. This is the beginning of the firing process within our chemical training, right? Next slide. Oh, we'll skip this one, actually. Yeah, next one. So this one, the rising of the steam. Uh, this is how they start to move the heat uh, through your body. This is the process of it. So we have three types of heat within alchemy uh, training, within Taoism, within Nadan. Three types of fire. The first one we call pathological fire. That's not great. You probably guessed from the name. That's not what we want. Pathological fire is no good. Essentially what it means is you drain the kidneys, you get a bit of adrenal collapse, too much heat rises up to the head. The results of this being headaches, uh, dizziness, uh, mood swings, paranoia, stuff like that, all the fun stuff, uh, which I've been through all that. That was a bit of fun, but that's the pathological fire that can come from this kind of training. And it's part of the reason why, in order to avoid it, they do two things. One, open the body, like we said, so it's got lots of space, so it can move through. And the second one is build that magnet within the abdomen nice and strong, that dantian. It becomes like an anchor on the bottom to pull it back down. Then the second fire we call the false fire. The false fire or the fake fire. It's a little bit of a... Uh, not the best name for it, to be perfectly honest, because the false fire you do have to go through. It's just not the eventual aim. Like, it's okay, the false fire, it, we have to pass through it. The false fire is an increase of that energy that moves through the nerves. So as it's moving through your body, it's hitting more and more blockages or tensions or whatever in the nervous system. And when it hits something that's blocked or caught in the nervous system, it generates heat. It's back to that idea of when there is resistance, the heat is developed. Now that process, as it carries on, because your mind and your nervous system are very, very closely intertwined, right? Very closely connected. As it burns through blockages in the nerves and they relax in the release, then also there's changes that take place on the level of your mind as well. So you start to relax and release things. Mind becomes more calm, more centered. Maybe not uh, jade realms yet, but definitely uh, calm, more centered, more still, more healthy. Now the false fire must burn through and then end. It must finish. We must complete the false fire. Because once the false fire is finished, the idea is that the resistance is gone, the body is open enough, there's nothing to generate resistance, so there's nothing to generate heat. So it just kind of ends. It just kind of finishes. It, it fades away. In my experience, I'm slow. That was like five or six years for that process, for the false fire. Other people do it quicker, but maybe uh, more hang-ups. I'm not sure. Then the final one, the true fire, is really, to me, the basis uh, of really the important part of Nadam, the true fire. The true fire is very, very specific. Now, the true fire happens when we learn to extract something out of the base of the body. They call chun yang or pure yang. Sometimes called jing hua. Like, uh, I guess you would translate it as the essence, uh, the, the best part of your essence, <laughs> the cream of the crop of your essence, I suppose. And that yang spark that we draw out, uh, the jing hua or the, the chun yang, it's a little uh, like sharp, hot point that is pulled out of your jing down near the base of the body and it enters into the abdominal space and it's quite hard to extract. When you speak to alchemists about it, they say there's always should be warnings around that part of the process because you will become, um, I always get these two words mixed up and then people panic, infertile, not impotent, right, infertile. You become infertile when you extract that energy out of the essence because that essence that they're taking, the chun yang, it's the part of your energy that would produce life if you were to um, have a child. Okay? So once you start to extract that chunyang out, actually you're firing blanks. You, can't, uh, you cannot conceive a child anymore because you're extracting that seed out of the essence. So for, for lay people, certainly, I suppose it's quite a big uh, choice to make, right? It can be reversed, but it's not a quick process to reverse. You know, it, it takes a few months, maybe a bit longer. So, when that little spark is extracted out, what it feels like is an electrical shock. That's what it feels like, hitting you in the perineum, sometimes uh, in the genitals, sometimes in the lower back. It's, it's like a little sharp prick, and it almost feels like um, if you've ever had an acupuncture needle badly put in, just like, like that, it feels a little bit like an acupuncture needle hitting you in the base of the nervous system. Again, no visualization, nothing, just a, a natural process in the body from what we're doing. 
This little chunyang seed is then extracted up through the body and it starts to move up through the nervous system until it hits the brain. Okay, you will feel it. It's very, very clear. It goes right into the brain. And it starts to go between, as far as I can make out, what they call the mud pill palace uh, and the crystal palace, two regions of the brain, which as far as I can make out are roughly where the pituitary and the pineal gland are, give or take, you know, as best as I can find in my own head. It's those two points. Between them, the chunyang starts to collect and it forms a little electrical current between the two. And it feels like you're getting a little electrical shocks inside your, your brain. Again, not amazingly comfortable, uh, but you get used to it. And as it starts to make that little electrical shock, then something starts to rain back down through your body. Okay? It starts to drip back down. What it will start as is your mouth will fill up with a very, very sweet substance. If you kind of took uh, maple syrup, especially if you're Canadian, you know what that is. If you take that kind of syrup and then you kind of five times the sweetness of that taste, it's almost sickening. That's what appears inside your mouth and it starts to fill it up. And then when you swallow it, it runs back down through the body and as it goes down through the body, it starts to really produce the change that Nadan is after. It produces hormonal and chemical changes inside the body and starts to fill the dantian, the abdominal space, with the ingredients for the elixir. So it's the basis of the alchemical uh, training, essentially. The terminology they use for this, as I say, you've got the three fires, the pathological, the false, and the true fire. The last one is the true fire. But on top of that, they also call it fire and water mixing, or cannonly mixing is the phrase for it. So in modern times, cannonly mixing or fire and water mixing has been mistranslated as, in my opinion, within alchemy, we imagine two colors and we switch them around. But it's not. It's the extraction of the yang, the fire, from the base of your sexual fluids that moves up through the spine till it generates a hormonal change inside your body, which is like a liquid, water, that moves down through your body to then fill up the dantian and transform the way that the body functions. At that stage, that would be the basis of the alchemical process. All the while, while that's going on, what it's starting to do is move through the channels in your body as well. So it will start to move from nervous system, maybe like dense level we could say, through to something a bit more subtle. And then what starts to appear inside your body and inside your awareness is a direct experience of the channel system, specifically the central channel and the two that run either side of it. So the difference within alchemy that I could find really, the sort of main difference I could spot, was that rather than trying to use the awareness to connect with the channels, it's like we bludgeon the energy system essentially. It's not a very subtle process, it just takes a bit of doing, until eventually the channels force themselves into your awareness. So that while you're sat there practicing, you're thinking, okay, well I'm doing the usual thing, nervous system doing this, nice sensation, sweat in buckets, blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden these other structures start to appear within your awareness. So then the central channel appears within your body, first of all somatically, tangibly, then visibly, and then it starts to move, and then electrical currents start to move into it, and then that leads you through to the next stage after alchemy, which will be able to work with the channel processes. So just a little bit on this, because really I just wanted to explain the firing process but uh, on the left, obviously, you've got your um, uh, power, isn't it, from the tumor process, for the spirits going out. On the right, you have from the Xing Ming Guizhi, that's right, yep, Xing Ming Guizhi, a classical text on alchemy, a very, very important one, uh, a seemingly similar diagram, seemingly similar representation. So if I had more time, again, I would explain the uh, symbology within the, the script, because if you understand, in order to understand alchemy and Taoism, you almost need the kind of meanings behind what some of the phrases are, but it doesn't matter, we can use the picture. The idea is that the more that that uh, substance, or that true water, sometimes called um, true gold, they have different terms for it, is extracted through the body and led down to the base of the body, we then use that as the substance to fuel the results of our meditative training. So Taoism then has a whole process of meditation in its own right to develop something called Tai Ding, which is very similar to uh, Samadhi, uh, essentially. And then with the protracted periods in Samadhi, then that energy from the base of the body starts to fuel it, and this starts to generate the potential for the production um, of what they call the, well, the, the red child, in this case, or essentially the immortal spirit. This was the basis of their practice. 
So they describe this very, very metaphorically, which is a part of the, the problem within Taoism, because they would essentially say that this whole process is called heaven and earth coming together. That's essentially what it is. As in earth being the body, extraction of those essences to come together to take the body to a highly efficient state, and then heaven being that substance that is produced from their opinion within the, the consciousness itself that comes together and mixes within the body in order to generate uh, the potential for new life or immortality uh, within our chemical processes. So, I'll leave it there. That was dead on 20 minutes. Happy enough with that? Look at that, not even one minute over. Thank you.